Okay, this is Tracking Monsters, um, paragraph 9. Gila monsters do not have permanent homes. That means they are always moving around. An abandoned pack rat burrow might be a good cool summer spot, while squeezing under a sunny rock can provide a cozy winter shelter. As with all reptiles, the body temperature of Gila monsters changes with their environment. The beeping radio inside the tracked Gila monster also estimates its body temperature. Okay, so the tracker that they put in doesn't just tell where it is, but it also does, the, it can kind of like, not 100% say, but pretty close what the temperature is. The warmer the body temperature, the faster the radio beeps. Researchers carefully record the body temperatures of each lizard every time they track it. That way they know how much warmer or cooler the animal is in the, the various shelters, which are like its homes or wherever it's hanging out, it uses throughout the year. That rock, The rock that number 291 is currently under gets a lot of sun on one side, says Brian. It might make a decent winter home. So um, since it's getting out, that rock will be nice and warm. So it means that the um, lizard will be nice and warm for the winter. Bio blitz and microchips. Filling out number 291's data sheet is taking a bit longer than usual. Everyone except Brian Park is new to the Gila monster science. The hikers are volunteers taking part in BioBlitz, a 24-hour scientific inventory of every species in Seguro National Park. Okay, so that means these people are doing this because they want to. They're not getting paid. And they're doing this for a full 24 hours. And every time they see an animal, they have to stop and take um, notes about it. They are among the thousands of citizen scientists helping out during the event. So that's a lot of people, so that lots of people can join in the activities and learn about biodiversity. BioBlitz often takes place in national parks near urban areas like Seguro National Park. Okay, so it's just an opportunity for people to come out and help. The city of Tucson, Arizona fills the space between the park's two separate halves. Okay, so it's just saying the park is really big and on one side is the park. Tucson, Arizona is kind of in the middle and the other side is the rest of the park. It's interesting. Citizen science, which a citizen means just like it's this normal person who doesn't, not a, didn't go to school for this. Citizen science is important for involving the community, says Kevin. It's a big part of the study that researchers at the University of Arizona, including Kevin Bonine and Brian Park, are doing in Seguro. In fact, their Gila monster project depends on it. We try to get the public to send us their sightings, explains Kevin. How? They've posted colorful signs at kiosks near trails and in visitor centers. The sign said, have you seen me above a plump pink Gila monster? Below the photo are instructions for documenting the sightings and sending the information. Kevin says people out hiking and park staff can really help us out. The key is to taking a photograph of the Gila monster that clearly shows its markings the pattern on each individual is like a fingerprint, says Kevin. Researchers use the color patterns to identify individual Gila monsters. Okay, so if you're out in this park taking a hike, you see a Gila monster, you take a picture of it, and then you can send it to them. They want to make sure you can see like its markings on it, so like a, the color patterns, because they said every um, Gila monster has a different color pattern. Here is um, some more photos from that bio blitz. All right. 
Sometimes the researchers receive a photo from a citizen scientist that matches a Gila monster they've tagged, which is pretty exciting, says Kevin. So they've already, when they say they've already tagged it, that means they've already put that little transmitter in there. So now that, that's really cool because they might not have information, but now this person who's been a, a hiking or doing whatever found that Gila monster so they have even extra information for their data. The Gila monster project has been tagging the large lizards with microchips since 2009. Each tiny microchip tag looks like a metal grain of rice. It is the same kind of ID microchip tag that veterinarians use for dogs, cats, and other pets. Each tag has an identification number that a handheld scanner can read. We've tagged more than 150 Gila monsters, says Kevin. Every new Gila monster that the field biologists come across get a tag. So I do want to make sure you understand this. Not every one of those Gila monsters get a transmitter. The transmitter does a lot. Like it tracks their location. It tells their body temperature and that type of thing. A microchip only works when it's being scanned. So you can't track them by its microchip. The only way that you know it is that when somebody scans it like takes a wand and goes across the body and and that's how that works okay here ooh, bumpy this is what their skin looks like and remember those little bumps are actually filled with bone which is kind of creepy there's a picture of a gila monster you can see how it kind of blends in with the rocks there's the transmitter um, by implanting a radio transmitter inside a Gila monster, researchers can track the lizard's movements over time with radio telemetry. So that's using that. This is the microchip. You can see it's much, much smaller. The skin bumps of the Gila monsters have tiny bones inside them called osteoderms. This is that one right here. And the pattern of color are unique to each animal. So no two Gila monsters have the same color patterns. The Gila monster tag right here is the small metal pellet with the microchip ID. So it's almost like getting a shot. Catching monsters, the punishing desert sun is sinking toward the distant mountaintops. They're calling it punishing because it's slow. It's so hot. It's still 85 degrees. The giant piled up pink and beige boulders, which are their rocks, soak up heat like pizza stones. So this is just saying that even though the sun might be setting and it's getting dark, the, so, the rocks have been in the heat all day and in the sunlight, and so they're still very, very warm. Kevin doesn't seem to break a sweat, however, even though he's got one hand firmly gra gripping a Gila monster, and his other hand is what looks like a small plastic toothbrush. Kevin puts the softer end of the plastic tool on the lizard's closed mouth and gives it a nudge. How do you get a Gila monster to open wide? You talk to him very nicely, he jokes Kevin. Evidently, it's true. The smoky pink lizard takes the bait, giving the plastic prod a few chomps. It will leave behind enough mouth cells for a DNA sample. And here we go. There's, they're doing that. They're trying, of course, this is not hurting them. And once they get that saliva in there, that'll give them DNA. So the um, plastic probe, which looks like a toothbrush to us. Okay, and this, it, we're gonna learn about when my, in my next reading, cause I'm gonna stop the recording here. But um, they put the tail in here and they, this will help estimate how much fat is stored in the Gila monster. Um, by measuring the volume of water, it displaces. So that water, the tube is filled with water up to a certain amount. Let's say it's filled up to 10. They stick the tail in it. 
and that means water comes pouring out the top. Then they look at the measurement and they see, well, maybe it's a seven now, maybe. So that tells them like three units of water has been displaced, which means water is gone, three units is gone, which will help them measure the, um, the tail because they are saying a well-fed, healthy Gila monster has a fat tail. So that tail helps them survive. I'll be back with our final recording in just a 